This podcast is brought to you by Most Valuable Podcasts, leading the league in podcasting entertainment. Welcome in, ladies and gentlemen, to Behind the Pen. My name is Mike Rankin, and I am your host today. And I'm very excited because opening day is right around the corner. There's three days left, and there's plenty to be excited about, especially on the Chicago side of it. Today, I'm very excited to bring on a guest that is very knowledgeable in the baseball world, especially with the White Sox. He writes for Future Sox. If you don't know what that is, the website about prospects and everything else related to White Sox baseball. And he was kind enough to join me on my show today. And his name's Brian Billick. You can follow him on Twitter at Brian Billick underscore. It's exactly how it's spelled, exactly how it sounds. Brian Billick, thanks for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Mike. Thanks for having me. Oh, absolutely. It's my pleasure. So you took a trip to Arizona this spring. Uh, how was that? It was awesome. We go almost every year. We get a group of like 10 guys between my dad, his brother, my cousins, uh, another family friend. And, you know, it's a lot of hanging by the pool and drinking. <laughs> I wish I could have got more baseball in on, on the minor league side of things. But, you know, it, I was able to have a, a couple of fruitful conversations while I was there. Um, you know, definitely learned a bit. The, the team is very happy with uh, J.B. Shuck. I know a lot of fans on the Internet were kind of confused by his con- inclusion on the roster because he's, he's not a guy that gleams uh, in the respect of advanced metrics. But I think Robin Ventura really values what he brings to the team off the bench, even if it is just being a late inning pinch hitter against right-handed pitchers. The White Sox made a lot of moves this offseason. Um, first, are you happy with the moves that they made with the additions of Frazier? They shored up the catcher spot, brought in Laurie for second, and he could play pretty much anywhere. Are, do you think this is enough for the White Sox to contend this year? I, I'm really happy with the offseason they made. Um, you know, I'm skeptical, of course. I mean, last season, we, you know, a lot of fans were happy as well. But I, I think the amount of risk in, in this offseason is minimal. I mean, the, the package the White Sox sent to L.A. For, for Todd Frazier, you know, if things were to go awry early in this year and, and they had to move um, Todd Frazier at the deadline, not that you want to do that, he's still, uh, you know, a very liquid asset, and I think they could get a return that's even better. Um, other than that, they're, they're betting on a lot of, uh, you know, consistent performers, guys like Austin Jackson, guys like Matt Leto. And, and they got these guys at a very discounted price. So going into the offseason, a lot of the pundits weren't sure whether the Sox were going to push and go for it again, as they always do, or, or tear things down and, and, uh, and rebuild. But I think if things go right for the Sox, they're a scary team in the playoffs. Nobody wants to face Chris Sale. Nobody wants to face Jose Quintana. And I think the world's going to learn a lot more about Carlos Rodon this year. But at the same time, if things don't go the way Rick Hahn and Kenny Williams hope, they didn't overextend themselves this offseason, and they're not really messing up any uh, any long-term moves as far as uh, you know a rebuilding type scenario. I think it was a really good thing that they brought in Austin Jackson as, as that kind of fourth outfielder piece who really kind of projects to be the center fielder, which allows Adam Eaton, obviously, to move from center to right or left or whatever, and then you can have Melky go to DH or whatever. So I feel like that move was really flexible, but... Do you think that they missed out on somebody like like a you want to assess it as Alex Gordon, Dexter Fowler? Do you think that move would have put them over the top, or are they good with what they get? I mean, I'm I'm really afraid. During the off season, I, I almost went away, went away from my brain and started operating with my heart more. They looked at it as they made uh, you know a certain price point and a certain contract structure structure, and they were kind of going to stick to it. They were going to stick to their guns there. And every one of those guys went outside of their range. I mean, talks with Justin Upton never really went that far. And the other two with Gordon Us, but if they were in it to the end. But, you know, you make that move and things don't go well this year, I think you have to rebuild if things don't go the way they wish this year. They really, I mean, I know the Sox are known as that team that never really uh, put, put the full effort towards rebuilding, but they have to. And, and if they, you know, signed Alex Gordon and, you know, he has a couple hamstring issues during the year and, and all of a sudden you go 77 and uh, 85, it's like, what, is, what does that do for your rebuilding process? It, it, it would be a big, uh, a big trouble moving forward. So it's not going to appease the fans, uh, signing a guy like Austin Jackson, but I think you made a good point. He, he moves Adam Eaton to a corner. Adam Eaton could be a plus defender in a corner, where in center field he's average or below average. Um, you know, moving a guy like Avi Garcia to DH out, instead of having him in right field, that's a big addition by subtraction. I mean, it was funny when the Sox signed Austin Jackson and the whole 
Adam LaRoche thing happened. They lost LaRoche and added Austin Jackson. And most projection modules had them uh, increasing like three games just from <laughs> just from those two moves with, uh, you know, Avi and uh, Adam LaRoche being additions by – or yeah, being additions by subtractions with uh, lesser roles and, and LaRoche retiring. We don't have to go into the whole LaRoche saga, but – with him leaving, honestly, that's kind of a blessing for the White Sox to just dump $13 million like that, and you don't have to deal with this bum again. So what are they going to do with the 13 mil that they had onto their uh, payroll? I mean, it's interesting because w- with the timing of, of LaRoche leaving, it's, there's no one really out there to spend $13 million on. Uh, from what I understand, Han keeps saying he's talking with other teams and he's looking elsewhere, but they really do lack a left-handed bat, whether it be in the five hole or the six hole or you know, a platoon type bat. And I, I wouldn't be surprised if they picked up uh, a guy like James Loney or, you know, David Murphy was another guy who I thought made sense. But they, they got to get something in there. Right now, it, it's looking like they're going to break camp with fans or Ishikawa in that 25th spot. And uh, that's a less than ideal scenario. So it, it is a blessing to lose a, you know, a negative war player like Adam LaRoche, who you're paying $13 million. But at the same time, I think LaRoche would have had some sort of, some sort of a, a rebound. He was injured last year, and it was kind of underreported. But uh, they don't really have anyone to replace him. So we'll have to see. Definitely uh, in July, if they felt so inclined to make a move, assuming they are in the playoff race, they have that money to spend. So I'm sure uh, Rick Hunt's happy about having that flexibility. What about the rotation? Sale, Rodon, and Quintana obviously are the guys in the top, but... Once you get below that, Danks is kind of a question mark. He looked good this spring. I guess Navarro picked up on a, a thing where he was tipping his pitches, which I thought was interesting. But your fifth starter mm-hmm. was there was a three te- three guy competition: Jacob Turner, Eric Johnson, and Matt Latos. And it looks like it's Matos Latos's job, but he hasn't been very good the last few years, and not even this spring has been good for him yet. There was a report that Kevin Gausman was kind of pursued by the White Sox after he was released by the uh, Orioles. Do you think that's a possibility? And do you think this rotation is good enough to carry them throughout the season? Well, I love the depth that they have in their rotation. Um, it, you know, a lot of people hate John Danks, but you, you pit him against the other fifth starters in the league, and he's pretty acceptable. He's going to get you 180, 190 innings. You know, he, he might get shelled every third start out there, but he's, he's a good veteran presence in the clubhouse. And quite frankly, I don't know that his spot is, is that secure when, when uh, we're moving into June and July if he's not performing. And they do have options like Eric Johnson and Carson Fulmer and perhaps Jacob Turner to, to uh, knock him out of the spot. And, you know, they did say that Matt Latos was competing for that fifth spot, but I think that was more of a formality uh, in the media. I don't think the White Sox ever doubted that he was going to be there in their rotation. And he's a move that I, I'm pretty excited about. Uh, just getting him at an annual value of three million dollars. I mean, that's right. if he pitches 100 innings of, of full ERA ball, he'll be worth more than that three three million dollars. So I, I don't put a lot of weight into his last two years because he did have uh, you know the shoulder issue last year. He came out in Miami and he was absolutely terrible. But he was sitting 88, 89, and once he got fully recovered he got his fastball up back over that 93 range and he was very good and uh you know he even moved the Dodgers to to give up some good pieces to trade for him and he didn't work out when he went to LA but when you have three starts and the ball I think he had like a bat of over 400 when he was with the Dodgers oh, and they just weren't in a position to you know let him work out the kinks but you know he's a guy that's discounted because of his attitude and I, I think he's a guy that has to understand that this is a good opportunity for him to come to a place where, where pitchers typically thrive, where pitchers, um, you know, who have lost it, have, have found it here with, with Don Cooper. So I, I think he could be a, a, a big point of surplus value at the back end of the rotation. You mentioned Carson Fulmer earlier, and I want to shift the focus on some prospects here because there was a few that kind of caught my eye as I was just following along throughout the spring. Um, what's your opinion of Jacob May, this 24-year-old center fielder? He was in double A last year, spent... I think it was 98 games down there. Did really well. He's got speed, good defensively. He doesn't really have much power. Do you think he's kind of a piece that we can look forward to as White Sox fans moving forward? Do you think he could be a center fielder for, of the future, or what do you what do you think? Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm glad you brought up Jacob May because uh, ever since you know going to Sox Fest and and hearing just about everything Rick Hahn, I think I was at every one of his seminars and and interviews. And he was quick to bring up Jacob May as a guy who can contribute in 2016. 
Um, I, I think his floor is very high. The guy is a gazelle in center field. He is like, uh, I think, 70 or 75 grade speed in center field. And he's probably going to end up hitting eighth or ninth in the major leagues if he's in a starting capacity. But this is a guy who's got good on-base skills. He's a smart player. Um, I had the had the fortune of interviewing him, and he's a very uh, well-adjusted kid. He's very polite, and, and he does well with his coaches. And just being out in spring training, that was another guy whose name came up more than a few times. Uh, Nick Capra, who works with the Sox, he uh, was, was very bullish on Jacob May. You know, they're very happy with how he played this spring and what he brought to the game. And, you know, he was on the roster, I think, up until, what, two days ago. He was on the roster all the way up to when they were making their last cut. So they, they like what they see with him. And last year, he was hitting 300 with a 350 on base percentage in the first half. And he had an unfortunate collision with Tim Anderson that kind of, uh, you know, just ended his season abruptly with the concussion he received uh, on behalf of that concussion. So I expect him to come back to Charlotte and, uh, and, and look good there again. And if the Sox have an injury, that he might be the guy that comes up. You mentioned Tim Anderson. He was the 2013 White Sox first round pick. Am I correct? Yes. So how close is he to the major leagues? Because I know they have this dynamic duo of Jimmy Rollins and Saladino over at short and Britt Laurie at second. Do you think Anderson could contribute sometime this year, maybe next year in the infield? Certainly next year. I I think that's the plan the Sox have with him. He's had a very uh, traditional trajectory in the White Sox system. He hasn't been, he's been moved quickly considering how raw he was when he was drafted. But he wasn't rushed, as the White Sox have been accused of doing with their other prospects. He's kind of been on a year-by-year uh, movement. But he's a guy that he's, – he's a free swinger, and, and his athletic ability and his fast speed really allow him to be a free swinger and kind of get away with it. So I think starting the year in Charlotte, he's going to face a lot of crafty, you know, 27-year-old starters who aren't quite good enough to pitch in the pros, but they're, they're you know, darn good pitchers in AAA. And they might expose him, and, and he's going to have to learn how to, you know, cut back in the head of the count, swinging at the first pitch all the time, stuff like that. So he might have a slower start than he's typically used to. But I think we, seeing him in September this year is, is definitely not out of, you know, out of the realm of possibility. But looking forward to next year, he, he's probably going to be the guy they, they pencil in at shortstop. Saladino is a, a fundamentally sound player with, with some good, uh, with a good glove and a good arm at all three positions in the infield. But he's not, he's not a guy you uh, hit your wagon to if, if you're looking to be a playoff team. And I think Tim Anderson certainly could be. And how about Carson Fulmer? Do you think he, because the White Sox are really big on bringing up top pitching prospects. We saw him with Rodon and Sale. Do you think Fulmer mm-hmm. is up at m- middle of the season this year, around June maybe, in the bullpen? Or can he even handle the starting duties? I, I think he could handle either side. It, it's interesting because the White Sox have more pitching depth than they've had and I don't know how long, at least at least the last five years, this is the best pitching depth they've had. They, they even have some intriguing bullpen options in, in Omont and, and Tommy Conley that are going to be pitching at Charlotte. And whether he's going to be up in, in May or September, I don't know where, where they're going to put him. You know, these are just whispers, and I, I would only take them with a grain of salt, but it's people that are around Carson Fulmer seem to think he's going to be up in May. Nice. So I, don't, I, I don't know what capacity that would be in. I mean, Carlos Rodon came up on April 21st last year, but the Sox had Hector Noesi, who's been one of the worst pitchers in baseball, <laughs> in their fifth spot. So there, there was room for a guy like Rodon last year, where, you know, Fulmer, I'm sure he, he had the opportunity to pitch his way into the White Sox bullpen or into the White Sox rotation, but he might need an injury or, or a player or two really underperforming for that to happen. Really good stuff, man. So I'm going to, I'm going to, End this interview here with your predictions for the AL Central and if the White Sox make the playoffs or not. I want, I'm interested to hear because the, the Central, I can't put my finger on it. Like I'm trying to dissect this you. thing, and it's like the Tigers, they made moves to improve their offense. They got a closer. And the Twins, you know, they have those three-headed monsters, and Rosario, Sano, and Buxton down there. If they can produce, you never know with them. Then the Indians have one of the best rotations in baseball. I just, I don't know. I, I can't tell. What do you think? I think the American League... Projecting the American League this year is, I mean, it is going to look so bad. Anybody who makes their projections this year is just going to look back in September and, and, and laugh at them. Because in the, between the Central and the East specifically, any one of these teams could win the division. I, I think both the Twins and the Orioles are you know, going to be the most popular spot. Uh, their most popular spot will be last place. But as you brought up with the Twins, they have a very dynamic offense. I personally don't think they have – any semblance of a pitching rotation that looks like a playoff roster, but they surprised some teams last year. If I had to pick somebody coming out of the Central, I've always liked Cleveland. 
Uh, they've made a lot of defensive improvements this year. I think uh, Lindor might be an MVP candidate. And, and those three guys at the top of the rotation are, are pretty scary. So nobody's going to want to face them in the playoffs. But at the same time, you brought up the Tigers. It's like that team got a lot better. And they even got a little bit younger. And everybody's just putting them in fourth place as if they don't have any talent. No, nobody wants to face their, their, their bats two through seven. I mean, they have some serious right-handed power in Detroit. So the Sox with their role as left-handed pitchers are going to be uh, – they're, they're going to be getting in some battles with the Tigers. So, you know, the Sox definitely are the team that I'm, I'm, I want to pick, but I, if I had to gun in my head, I, had to, I would go Cleveland. But the Sox got to win in the division. Uh, the last, ever since Rob Ventura has taken over, they have been atrocious in the division with, uh, you know, the Royals and the Twins specifically just having their number. If the Sox want to win this division, they got, they got to play the best in their division. All right, Billick, thanks a lot for joining me. Once again, Brian Billick from Future Socks. You can follow him on Twitter at Brian Billick underscore. Thanks a lot, man. It's really, really good stuff. Keep up the good work. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. That was my White Sox guy, Brian Billick, and he had a lot of useful information for all you White Sox fans out there. I hope you enjoyed it because he knows his stuff, and you should probably follow him on Twitter if you haven't already. But 